everybody. Welcome. Um, if you haven't done your, oops, hold on. Oh, I'm in twice. Okay, now I'm only in once. If you haven't done your um, pre-game drawing, put that on Twitter at some point. I put mine, it is not great. Um, <laughs> now I need to pre-game with something else to cool that burn. Um, so today we have Kevin Thorne, who I'm mm -hmm. sure most people in this chat know, but Kevin is the owner your, of Nugget Head Studios and um, an all around great guy. One of the things he does is helps people learn that they can in fact draw. And so that's why I put that little pregame. By the way, Kevin, if you didn't see it, it was to draw the thing closest to you and this one's mine. Uh, put it up a little closer. Oh, your pencil cup. Very nice. This is the real life version. Yeah. Pen cup. Okay. Pencil cup. Pen cup. Yep. Very yes. well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kara. I like the I like how tall that birthday cake would have been though. Um, That's funny. That's funny. So um, usually with our um, Monday, first Monday of the month webcast, we talk, we go into a deep dive on one project. And yeah. I don't know which project you're gonna do. I try to keep myself very beginner's mind with these things yeah. so that I don't have to like, you know, I don't come up with all these questions ahead of time. It's just trying to figure out in the moment the question. So I get to pick what project we're gonna talk yeah. about? Yep, and we're gonna talk about how the project was, um, yeah. like project dynamics, how you did it, how it ended up, and then what you learned from it. Wow, okay. <laughs> It's, it's we're getting ready to go into phase two, so there's still more, which is fun because we get to take those lessons learned and, and apply them as we go into phase two, oh, which that's doesn't good. happen very often. Because you know we we do big projects and we do a lot of lessons learned, but then how often do we do the same project again, relatively close to the one we just finished, in order mm -hmm. to apply those lessons that we learned? So I'm I'm really fortunate to be able to do that here shortly here. It's uh, towards the end of the year, we're going to kick it off. So, yeah. yeah. So, for those of you that um, don't know or haven't heard about this project, it was a. Um, how many? Uh, well, let me ask you this question, I guess. Anybody remember a project I did nine years ago now called Mission Turfgrass? Have you ever heard of that one? No. Well, that was the beginning of sort of this instructional comic journey. Um, that led to a project with the CDC on um, um, HIV patients living with AIDS. And we told that story through two infected patients living in the same neighborhood, totally not connected. Um, but then how, you know, with the community health department and the uh, clinic, and just more of a story to help understand what folks like that have to go through. Um, a couple years, the story lasted like a well, it was an e learning course, generally speaking, uh, but it was a story that spanned their lives over two years. That was about five years ago, four years ago. I get a call from um, the University of San Francisco and the University of Utah uh, research department, and they're doing international work to help lower infant mortality rates in low um, third world countries, uh, specifically regions in those countries, for instance, uh, Northern India and uh, Kenya, places like that. Uh, specifically in Bihar or Bihar, India, um, where it's a hundred million population, which is just a, it's an enormous amount of people. Uh, and their challenge was they had existing training and it was simulation training for nurses where uh, master trainers, if you will, nurse supervisors would um, come or, or bring people, think of bringing your workforce in from different regional areas and bringing them to a central location to train on a simulation. So you got like train the trainer. And then those nursing trainers would then turn around and go back to their clinics in their neighborhoods 
and apply what they learned at the simulation. Um, that transfer of knowledge wasn't happening. It was happening, but not at the extent that they, they wanted to in order to move the needle on infant mortality rates. And, and part of it is just um, um, healthcare, just, just general health in that, and just not being able to take care of a, of a pregnant mother. Um, so one of the researchers contacted me and said, hey, we saw your work with the CDC four years ago. And it's always been something in the back of my mind that I wanted to do for a project and we have something that you'd be interested in. We need a comic story to see if we got to do something different because everything we've done is not working. How do we transfer the knowledge that we want to do in a comic story? Okay, let's give it a shot. So we, um, we had to do a lot of research um, uh, just in cultural awareness, um, you know, for the for that neighborhood and stuff. And by the way, um, I am doing a session at DevLearn about this project on cultural awareness when you're doing you know, visual comics and things like that, things you have to be aware of. Because we, we, we pay attention to that when we do like audio narration, how we write scripts, um, on-screen text, things like that. But when 90% of what is being shown is all visual characters, scenes, scenery, objects, gestures, body language, clothing. All of this stuff communicates body language uh, visually. So we had to spend a lot of time researching what it's like to live, not just the Indian culture in general, but live in that region, in that low income northern Indian region. What are some of the, you know, like your neighborhood has these little nuances about living in your town. And then what's it like to live in the South versus live in the North? What's it like to live in the United States? So you, you kind of stair-step those cultures. And we had to do the same thing. We had to go all the way down to the individual neighborhood and figure out what are those little cultures, things, those, and then step that up to the region and step that up to general Indian dress and, and, and uh, language and things like that. Um, to make it interesting, we had to... Uh, we did some different research on what folks are, inter what, what's entertaining, uh, what are they attracted to, um, what holds their attention when it comes to learning, things like that, entertainment-wise. Um, and it turns out um, they're huge superhero fans. They love superhero comics, which is right up my alley. <laughs> um, uh, we, we, my, my, uh, co-illustrator, co-comic artist, the, the first thing that we thought of was, I doubt very seriously they're in the Marvel, that that type of super. So if you think of, I know, if you ever looked at a Bollywood uh, video or Bollywood comics or something like that, you kind of get the general style. So then we had to do a lot of research in style, color, style, um, you know, what do the characters look like, things like that. So. Um, probably an enormous amount of analysis and discovery and research, more so than you would do on a typical uh, e-learning project or a training project that you would, because a lot of it is perceived affordance in that we already know what we know and our learners typically already know certain things about what they know. Mm -hmm. And we're going into a region that um, they don't manipulate mobile tablets very generally. So, you know, there's how do we, how do we make this intuitive? How do we go through a story, self-paced, digital comic, motion comic, there's animation. How do we make it flow and move in such a way and carry folks through the story um, where we're not having to put a lot of um, click this to move forward or tap here to go next. Or, you know, we, had to, we eliminated all of that. So everything was communicated visually, either through prompts or gestures or color or something. Um, so um, that initial research you did where you identified what entertains people in that region, what they were going to, how did you perform that research? Was it talking to people? Was it like talking to people who know those people? How did you do that? Yeah, so the, uh, the research department in the uh, University of Utah were our direct um, stakeholders, if you will, subject, uh, stakeholders in terms of owner of the project. Uh, and then there's a couple of nonprofits, one out of uh, University of South San Francisco, and there's another big nonprofit called Care India out of India. 
So between those two, we had additional subject matter experts specifically on the ground in India. Um, the budget didn't call for myself and the other illustrator to go to India this time. Um, so we did weekly um, similar calls like we're doing right now, just weekly video calls where we could um, talk about things, they could tell us things. And then we just asked them just if you could go around your clinics and your existing simulation training environment and take pictures of just just take random pictures, just walk around with your phone and just start taking pictures, not of objects, but just take a, a million pictures. And then what we did is we spent, oh, uh, well, we, we, we ended up becoming quite the patrons at the local pizza store in the afternoon. So we go up there, get a slice of pizza and just lay all this stuff out on their table because we needed a big table. <laughs> And, you know, you go to the restaurants and they've got those big tables for like 12 people, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we went in and commandeered one of those tables at a restaurant and just laid all our artwork out and all our pictures, you know, consuming slices of pepperoni pizza in the meantime. And, um, but then we just, basically it was just a big puzzle. We just started putting all these pictures and data and all this stuff we had together and say, okay, this is, this is their life in this region. This is their life in this town. This is their life at their clinic. This is the life when they go to the training simulation. I mean, everything down to what a wheelchair looks like. Because when you think of a wheel, like you're talking about your drawing exercise at the beginning of this. If, if we were to say in the chat right now, <clears throat> everybody go draw a wheelchair. Well, you take that long-term knowledge of that perceived affordance of all the experiences you've ever had with a wheelchair, whether you've seen one, sat in one, pushed one, for whatever reason, you have a mental model of what a wheelchair is. I will guarantee anybody in this audience right now that draws that will be incorrect in terms of what a wheelchair is in India. It is nothing like what we think it is here. So it's little things like that that we had. I mean, all those little details took a lot of time. And we had sketches and drawings, and, and then we would do a lot of rough pencils and send them over there and make sure they had, um, we were correct, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then we spent, uh, you know, probably the biggest struggle we had was uh, clothing. Because mm -hmm. uh, the saris and the, the Samoa Kamis and uh, how it drapes across the body, the colors, uh, footwear, jewelry, um, the bindi, you know, you know between the, eye, the eyebrows uh, Indian women have. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's different color bindis and they're different sizes and some are tattoos, some are jewels, and they mean different things. Mm -hmm. Status thing. Um, their clothing and what they wear as a nurse, whether it's a lab coat over a sari or just a sari, an all-white sari versus an all-white sari with a color and scarf, mm -hmm. all of these things have positions and roles. So if you think of scrub colors in a hospital, mm -hmm. those scrub colors tell us what that technician or that nurse, typically, that healthcare provider, you know, what role they play in, in care. And it's very similar in that over there, but it's based on their um, saris and their colors that they wear and their bindings and their lab coats and all that stuff. It and reminds have, me um, it reminds me of developing things for military audiences. So if you get anything wrong, you've completely changed the meaning of who that person is, or, you know, and it's it's all you know not you know at least army costuming i don't so it's <laughs> it's really yeah, you need a, you need an expert <laughs> yes when we say subject matter expert we're not kidding we yeah. need we need someone that's truly knowledgeable in that area yeah so we got that all figured out um through process i mean we, we started building everything and drawing do a lot of rough sketches and drawing and then even after we went to final ink and color, we still had things wrong. So we had to go back. We just finished a big redraw of uh, the second episode mm -hmm. uh, because of the, unif the, the uniforms. We had, we had uh, I can't remember exactly, but we had a scarf that came over and just kind of draped and landed right here. Mm -hmm. And that's completely incorrect. There's nothing like that. It, it wraps the other way and it goes around the shoulder and down the back and then ties off at the waist. I didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's one of those things, even the subject matter experts that we had all along to make sure 
all of the drawings and all of the, the artwork was approved, um, you know, it's just, you, know, you have projects you get to the back end, it's like all of a sudden somebody says, hey, how come nobody caught that? And we just keep going on and fixing it that way. So, yeah, because it's not for lack of you checking in with this me. It sounds like you were in constant contact with all of the stakeholders to check sure. all of those little things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just, and I mean, it's just been a delightful experience. I mean, everybody is just, if they were, um, and I hope when I'm still putting my session together for Devlon, but uh, we've got, um, because, and the other advantage is because we have uh, researchers are our clients. Mm -hmm. They're all big into the back end feedback and data collection and how this works. And they've, they did a video feedback. So they put sort of the pilot, the first group of people that went through the pilot episode, um, instead of just writing your thoughts about what you thought and liked, disliked, they did a big video interview, a group video, like a, like a focus group. Oh, and they recorded them on a focus group and just listening and watching to them uh, talk about the things they loved and excited about. And they, they, and more importantly, I think what we love about the best part of it is the characters that we came up with, they can directly relate to. And that's the emotional connection or the hook uh, that we always look for when we're building training, especially uh, when you, if, if you have a, if you have a boss or a manager or a client or a customer that's courageous enough to say, hey, let's give this comic medium a chance, let's see what happens, then what you what you don't know that you will know later is that those stories and those characters will connect to your audience more than anything else that you can try. Mm -hmm. Unless you do a full on video with, with characters that they can relate to. Yeah, um, and that's something that I want to talk about. Um, sure. But first I wanted to check, what was the, so you came in with the medium, you knew the medium. Did the researchers have a performance goal in mind, a specific, did they know why the existing simulation wasn't quite hitting the mark and why an instructional comic was the best option? Yeah, because, um, and again, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it, it's really a difficult thing to explain. I mean, it took a long time for us to grasp it, but let's say you're going through some kind of a simulation training and you do something wrong or incorrect. Mm -hmm. What would you expect your facilitator or your trainer to respond to you? That that's wrong and the right, right thing so, to do. Yeah. Here's, you know, what, what do you expect? Well, the culture is you get berated and um, embarrassed in front of your uh, peers. Mm -hmm. That's the culture. And because of that, they become very intimidated because they're afraid to make mistakes mm -hmm. because they know they're going to get berated and intimidated and, and not harassed, but just, why did you do that? You know better than that. Why did you know, you shouldn't have done it that way. So, and it's in front of their peers mm -hmm. and, um, the peers are like, oh man, sorry, you know, sorry you just went through that kind of thing. So, but it's part of their culture. So one of the ways is um, if I were to ask you, um, define in your own words what a safe learning space is. For me, it's um, a space where I can find out I'm wrong and not everyone else knows I'm wrong. Okay. That's why I like e-learning so much. <laughs> the culture in, in this region, the culture, a safe learning space is physical. Mm. <clears throat> they don't understand the concept of emotional safe space. Right. So when we started, even the subject matter experts, we're like, we need, we need to, how do we, how do we talk about creating a safe learning space? And what I never forget one of the first answers well, we always make sure the chairs are pushed under the under the table, and we make sure that there's nothing you know in the way of people walking. And they're like, "No, no, that's not what we mean." And they're like, "We don't understand." Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is hard. <laughs> so, how do you one? How do you define a safe learning space from from an emotional context? How do you present that visually without words? 
mm -hmm. you tell a visual story sort of in a comic medium um, without a, like a literal definition. Right. So that was our, that was a huge eye opener. And, and the more we went on and more we went on, um, this culture is not, they're very literal. So metaphors or metaphorical meanings or um, different different ways that you visually kind of explain things through a metaphor and storytelling, totally, I mean, no way do they get it. So mm -hmm. we had to back things all the way back up and rewrite. I mean, we were, we were, had a pretty, I thought we had a pretty entertaining script, um, but then it's, we just kept going into more rabbit holes and dead ends about this because the, the, the pilot group that was helping us write the script kept coming back with, we don't understand this, we don't get this, this doesn't make sense to us. So we had to go back to the drawing board, literally speaking, um, the writing board, if you will, and mm -hmm. write a script that was more literal, but still carried the storytelling, it still it stayed focused on the storytelling aspect, but used language that was more literal language than metaphorical language. And that, <clears throat> obviously that, it trickles over into the artwork and then you know, it trickles down that way. So all of the, um, when you kind of are explaining character motivations, using subtext, or you have, you know, just minor references to how someone might feel about something, did you have to really try to hammer those in more to make them really explicit and clear? Um, yeah, so the um, empathy, you know, that's an emotion. So how do you define empathy? Mm -hmm. um, to a literal audience, um, and yeah. how do you do that visually? So, um, what we did, which was I think, and this is my illustrator, the fr uh, guy that works with me, um, he came up with, why don't we, why don't we give empathy a physical object? Why don't we, why don't we make empathy a character in the story? And I said, okay, that I like that approach. How do we do that? And that led us to, um, and this is for everybody here listening, if you're struggling with ideas and telling stories, um, get out of the L&D industry and go to storytelling industries like filmmaking, comics, cartoons, animation, um, because you'll find a lot of your answer, inspiration. Over there. And one of the inspirations we had, we were reading about how um, the Bat, uh, Batman the Dark Knight series started the three, the three series. Um, the director said, I will do this only if Gotham City is a character. Mm -hmm. Because we have to make Gotham City relatable. We have to make it feel like it's a real place. And if people can't emotionally connect to Gotham City, the rest of the story is not going to matter. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an eye opener. I said, okay, let's think about that. What other stories use objects as characters or spaces as characters well that led us up to recent black panther movie where wakanda became a character in the black panther movie so much so so believable that people actually thought that it was a country in africa mm -hmm. and you know that you saw it out on the social media it's like where is wakanda i've never heard of it this movie. but um so that's like okay that, that gets it now we just take sort of that idea and then how do we make empathy a character? And then we played around with a bunch of different ideas. Um, and we came up with goggles, empathy goggles, so that mm -hmm. when, you needed, when, you, when you needed to um, in, in express empathy, pull out your empathy goggles, put them on, and you can see things differently than without them. You can, you can see mm -hmm. empathy, right? Mm -hmm. So we started with that pair of goggles as a uh, as a as a physical object and then explain what they are and you know what does that mean well, I can see you know I can understand what somebody else is going through by looking through these lenses and then anytime you feel like that pull out your goggles mm -hmm. kind of, right? um, I like that that also takes inspiration from a you know pretty English specific idiom so it's like rose-colored glasses. We have that concept, yeah. but it's empathy-colored goggles. But yeah. you don't have to rely on people understanding the idea of rose-colored glasses for that visual technique right. to work. Right, and that's where 
well, for me, obviously, and I'm sure a lot of us, we take the English language for granted because of um, it's, it's probably the most difficult language to learn outside as a second language. As this being our first language, we understand all the metaphors and idioms and all the goofy slangs and stuff like that. It makes sense to us because that's our language. Um, other languages, so we get into language and linguistics, um, and then you get into visual language and visual storytelling. You start getting into some really deep um, the philosophical understandings of how do you get two languages to connect in one medium through visual storytelling. And it, sometimes it's easy, sometimes like this empathy thing is a little bit of a challenge to go through um, to get that, you know, and the way the way the story works because all of those like things like um, confidence, um, disinterest, um, things like that. Those are difficult concepts to define literally. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we do that visually? So the, the over the overall story uh, was two nurses who went to nursing school together, and they were best friends. After graduating, they went different ways to different clinics, which is similar to what the, the uh, career track would be in that region. Um, and then they would go on the training and they would then go on to their clinics, where one of the characters, the nurse, had a really great experience. He was um, always complimented and always encouraged and, and supported through her training. And she really had a great experience. And then when she got done with her training and she started caring in her clinic, um, she just made it a point that she was gonna dedicate her life to ensure that everybody coming behind her would experience the same type of training. Mm -hmm. the, the complete opposite was this other nurse went to a clinic where she was berated, intimidated, condemned, all of these things. So when she graduated and she went, she goes, um, that's it. I'm going to make sure that every nurse that follows behind me experiences the same difficulties I have. Mm -hmm. So now you've got good and evil, uh, and dark and light and day and night and dark and you know, good and evil. And then, so the one became the superhero and the one became the villain. Mm -hmm. And the villain, her weapon or her super, her weapon of choice, if you will, were bugs or insects. So we made all of these emotional things a bug. Mm -hmm. So disinterest was a bug. Um, Self-doubt was a bug. Lack of confidence was a bug. So she would be in her lab drumming up all these emotional bugs. And then every time the other superhero trainer was having a class, the villain would come with her bugs in an aerosol or with uh, and release these bugs into the room, which mm -hmm. you would be like, you know, like, oh, my confidence. Oh, my gosh, I don't, I don't think I'm good enough at this. And, and then the superhero would, would um, break out her energy spray. This is like an aerosol can, and she would, mm -hmm. that was her superpower. And then her superpower was a physical object. It was just an aerosol spray that would disinfect the bugs, and all the bugs would drop, and everybody would feel better and not be upset. And then that introduced the empathy goggles and stuff like that. So each one of these emotions was converted to some kind of a physical thing. So right. bugs are characters, aerosol, empathy goggles. And, and then you the, choose bugs specifically because of like the idea of an, it will just infest the whole area. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. right. And then, um, and then you got the superhero villain, easy story to tell. You know, mm -hmm. Conflict between two people. Yeah, the, with a good backstory that, you know, yeah. you're from the same place, you grew up together, you had the same, this is clearly, you know, the driving difference. It's not that you grew up in different places. It's not that you came from a different caste or a different area. It's that you had this experience, this specific experience, and that walls it off really well. Yeah, yeah. So episode one was the backstory, because that was the other thing we needed. We needed, because at first we were going to do um, just one big sort of story. Mm -hmm. And the more we got into it, the more we started learning about, you know, the literal meaning to things and the backstories and things like this. We can't really get into the instruction until we um, set the mood or set the emotion for these two characters and where they play and how they play in this. 
so episode one was the backstory. So there was a little bit, there's sort of a, a, a pre-story of how the one uh, superhero character became. It started with them both and then they split and then there was two storylines based on this, uh, the storyline, or excuse me, the superhero's path and the villain's path. And then we get into episode two and then episode two gets more deep into the actual um, instruction about uh, the empathy goggles and uh, self-doubt emotions and things like that. Okay, that's very cool. So did you get pushback making one story um, kind of specifically backstory, not really even about nursing or what they needed? They understood. Yeah, this, uh, um, I've done several of these sort of comic related type projects mm -hmm. and um, most are just, you know, they still want to lean more to the traditional instruction and oh, by the way, we just have these different kind of visuals. So mm -hmm. it's, we're getting away from the actual storytelling, but this, this client has been so uh, fantastic to work with. They're, they're just, I think it's because they're just big comic fans and everybody from India all the way over, they're all just big superhero sort of comic fans. And they're just excited about the idea that they're actually building one and they're making one and they're going through the process and what it takes to do one and the script writing and the character development and, and just seeing it from behind the scenes and what it takes to put something like this together. Um, mm -hmm. They're just been, it's just been fantastic. It's, I've worked, I worked on a game and one of the people on the project with me from the client side was huge game nerd too. Board game, love board game. Fun, and it man. made life so much easier. <laughs> so much easier. It, because they can no, they, because they can they can help with um, figuring out and solving mm -hmm. problems. They get it, you know. They they understand some of the what you have to go through. So mm -hmm. even though they understand the mechanics and the process and the skills necessary to put it together, they can help brainstorm and, and put things together. Mm -hmm. And it was it was it was kind of they called me out of the blue and said, "Hey, this is what we're trying to do." Are you available? Is it something you can? Is something you're available to do? I said, "Well, yeah, I, uh, yes, I am. Let me. This is a huge project, so um, as much as I can do the artwork, I can't. I don't have enough time to do manage the client, instructional design, script writing, and do all the artwork. So um, I brought in. An, I brought in a comic artist to help me. And that's the other thing. If you're looking, if you want to do this, um, you can find a thousand really talented and skilled illustrators, but if they don't understand sequential narrative and storytelling, and if they don't have experience drawing stories, then you're just hiring an artist. And then you're still gonna have to do all that legwork and, and become an art director and manage that artist on, I need this scene and I need it to be this way and this way. Well, working with a true comic artist knows how to change camera angles and knows how to tell a story visually and how to set the environment and build up to a climax visually. So you can write the script and then they can help you write the script and they can thumb it out. And it's just a really good partnership if you can get an illustrator that has that type of experience. There are a lot of um, the regular cinematic storytelling rules that an illustrator wouldn't know. And the, I think the only one I know is that, you know, the, the good guy comes in from the one side of the screen and usually the bad guy comes in from the other side of the screen. And it's not anything you know visually. Like you don't you watch a movie and think, oh, that guy's on that side of the screen. He's the bad guy, let's keep an eye on him. But it's, a, it's completely subconscious. But if you don't have it, just like if the women's room and the men's room in a restaurant is on the wrong side, it, it throws you off. Yeah. And those kinds of rules, is that kind of what he brought to the table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, for instance, and this is a, a simple way to do it. If you're, if you're wanting to, um, if, if the scene is going to play out with uh, two or more characters or one character or where there's some dialogue or there's some kind of, uh, where, where the actual event is going to happen or the action is going to happen. And let's say it's in a, in a high-rise building office. Well, you can start right there, but, but you're, you don't know exactly where they are physically in the world. So in a way to lead up to that is you do a horizontal shot of maybe a city, a silhouette of a city or in the background of sunrise. So now you get a general physical idea of where the city locate, is located. 
and then your next scene would be maybe at street level at in the city and then your next scene might be a character walking in the doors with an address or name of the building so now you're you're stepping into it's like okay here's the city here's the building in the city here's the entrance to the city and then maybe there's an elevator that shows floor 15. Oh, okay now i'm going up a few floors and then you show the office room and now you know exactly where you are in the scene and that's something that i think everyone who develops e-learning or any sort of training that includes visuals can take even if you're not doing an instructional comic when you're writing scenarios and you think you know betty and veronica are in the hospital working with a patient just having a scene means you don't have to include the more like the drudgery of the scenario as you know how to visually include that in the scene yeah. and it doesn't and it, have to be and that's answer. where yeah exactly because that's where you're you're drawing in your audience because they they can relate to okay I, I know that's a cityscape and i know that's a hospital because i can tell by the way it looks Maybe it's got a big red cross on it. Maybe there's an ambulance parked out front, and you don't have any words. You can just do background music at that point. But you're just, you're just set, you're establishing the environment by doing it, and that's drawing folks in. And then when you get to the dialogue, you get to the script. You've already got the hook because now they know where they're at. It's like you, you've taken them to that same physical sort of environment, and now they kind of get it. And that's and that's easy in some regard, and sometimes it's not. Right? So. Um, I'll give you an example of a, of a previous one. We had that CDC project. Um, we had uh, uh, the director of the health department and one of the one of the um, uh, bureau chiefs at the health department. Those two characters, and they just got a case file of somebody they had to go talk and interview with. So the script has okay. I'll be right back. I'm going to go over there now, and you, you see this character kind of opening the glass door of the building and walking out and waving behind her as she's walking out. So you, you get the sense that she's leaving the building. And then the very next scene, she's talking to this other character in an apartment building. So we're like, okay, what happened to time? Where did time go right there? So we had to think that's too fast. We have to slow time down. How do you do that? How do you slow time down visually? It's like, well, we need to establish the path from leaving this building, this this environment, over to this other building where this apartment is. So we added a couple scenes where we we saw her um, getting in her car in the parking lot. That was a scene, and then we saw her driving uh, through town, like a like just sort of a profile shot of her driving her car. And then we did a uh, established like a pullout map view sort of shot where you can see where she left and where she's going. And then when we get to where she's going, the next scene, we see her knocking on the apartment door. And mm -hmm. how do you know it's an apartment and it's not a house? Well, you put an apartment number on it. You put a little peephole in the door. Um, you show a hallway with maybe some other doors. And that just that visual scene tells you that you're not at a house, you're not at a townhome, you're not you're at an apartment complex of some kind. And then the next scene, we had the dialogue. So we had to shove in a couple extra scenes to establish time moving from one location to another. Mm -hmm. That's, and it's the way I think of those types of transitions is similar to um, just because I think of everything in terms of performance objectives. So in my head, I kind of think learner will understand that this building is an apartment. And then you figure out all of the enabling objectives. <laughs> so like has a number, has a people, has a wall. Um, all right. Yeah. And then just make sure you check all of those off. Probably would put it in a spreadsheet. And that, um, yeah, it just goes back to the fundamental, you know, storytelling, fundamentals of storytelling. You know, we talk about the fundamentals of visual design and the fundamentals of storytelling and the fundamentals of instructional design and theories and models and all this stuff. When you have to put all of that together in one bucket and, and come out with something on the other end, a lot of times you have to step away from one discipline and just go study one discipline for a while and just to get the basics and fundamentals and then bring in another discipline and then see where those two can marry up and match up. 
And then if you get that sort of model, then go get the other discipline. And then now I got to wrap that discipline around these two. Um, and it's a process. It takes, it takes a little bit of, it's a little bit more than your, especially when you're dealing with comics, instructional comics. Is there one comic, maybe not instructional, um, that you would recommend people to read? Really? You had to ask me that question. I don't know if you had one off the top of your head. The last one I read was Lock and Key, which is actually going to be a Netflix series. Which one? Lock and Key. And it's a graphic novel. So it's, you know, you get you get a whole story. Um, um, I would say I just started reading Paper Girls. Have you seen that one? No. Um, I really like the story, really like the article. It's four young girls who are, um, you know, 70s 80s time frame and uh they're delivering papers in the morning you know on their bikes um and uh they do they each have their route and they're each each of them are different you know uh, their characters but they end up um together in, in a little team because there's some kind of science fiction time shift where they travel in time and and they start fighting off villains and monsters and stuff like that. But there's these four teenage girls, and they each come from you know different backgrounds. And it, it's violent, and you know there's it's 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 young adult. It's it's a young adult kind of thing. Um, but I got hooked into that about a couple of weeks ago. It's been out for a while, and uh, I was looking for something different, something new to read. And uh, I was just going through one of those recommended graphic novels to read. So I, I downloaded the free version, which the first episode read it. And I was hooked in the first episode. And what's the name of it again? Paper Girls. Paper Girls. Okay. And um, and again, I'm analyzing comics not only just the story, but also the artwork and the story, mm -hmm. the visual storytelling, and just the way uh, visual storytelling, the way they were doing it. You know what? Um, can I show you something? Sure, please. And I'm, I'm this, I didn't prepare this, so if, it, if I can't make this happen in the next 30 seconds, then we won't do it. That's fine. And then, Kara, I'm going to ask your questions because I like well, Go ahead while I'm doing it. Um, oh, yeah, that's probably helpful. So the first one is, um, which I also wanted to know, how do you pitch personification to SMEs and stakeholders like the empathy glasses and the bugs? Did you get any pushback on that? No, actually, the uh, client came up with the empathy goggle idea. That's how involved they were, because we good. we uh, we been out. To, I went out. I flew out to Utah twice. You know, first was a kickoff meeting, a two day. Just we locked ourselves in a room for two days. Mm -hmm. um, and just and it was really cool because they had these this giant like digital smart board. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you get to draw on the wall and then save it digitally, and then you get to draw on the wall again, and it was just I was. I love that, right? Just yeah. to get to play and draw the wall. Um, but we, we spent two there, and then we got to the point where we were, we got to episode one, and we were working on episode two, and that's where we introduced him. And we were having a little bit of difficulty figuring things out. Um, and because we just, we were doing weekly one hour status meetings, and we needed more time to spend together and brainstorm and sketch out and stuff. So they, uh, they invited me back to um, Utah for another day. And uh, that's when we, they came up with an empathy goggle idea. Huh. Okay. Do you it's, think um, other projects you've worked on with a similar bent, you would have had to sell it a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it, it's going to dictate based on, um, it's going to dictate based on the story. I mean, everything, you know, just like even, right? You, you, mm -hmm. Your topic is going to dictate your approach to how you put it together. Yeah, and I think that's something that we could do a lot in the e-learning. Um, this, a lot of, it sounds like this comic is mostly kind of centered in the effective domain. Um, so, like, how are you making people feel with your approach? There are probably some skills baked in, but it's more emotion-driven than a lot of the e-learning that I've done. There aren't a lot of emotions and like, you know, contracts. All right, I found it. Let's see. Hang on. 
there's one there's one scene in here that um, really so I'll just show you the cover and oh. that's issue one mm -hmm. so from an artistic style it's very loose inky inky kind of way um, there we go You ready? Just mm -hmm. kind of look at look at the scene and study it for a minute. Oh yeah. So, where are we? In the bedroom. Okay. See the little square in the upper left corner there. Mm-hmm. That's okay. from the the view from the wall. This. This right yeah. here. So she's waking up, sleeping. Mm -hmm. She's in the top bunk. She hangs over the end and then uh, the, the light's there. But that little speech bubble down here is, she's asking if her sister is dead. Oh, she, okay. She had a nightmare. In the previous scene, she had a nightmare. Oh, but okay. This, this next page, and this is like the fourth page in the book. And this is what hooked me because of the storytelling and the artwork. Mm -hmm. Not a single speech bubble in this whole page. This is what I was talking about establishing the scene. Right. So she, it's it's early in the morning. She hears the truck outside, the paper truck coming up with the light, mm -hmm. the headlights. She goes over to her desk. She sees a far side cartoon. She clicks mm -hmm. on the light. She opens her drawer, and you see that object, which now that object is in the next panel, and it's her pocket knife. And then the next scene, she's outside cutting the strap off the bundle of paper to roll them up. Oh, so you're, so yeah. just those two pages was one speech bubble, but it established you're 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 right there every minute of time through that entire mm -hmm. leading up to. Okay, there's a young girl. She's got a sister. She had she has nightmares. Um, it's before sunrise. She's got to go downstairs and you know get her papers ready. Mm -hmm. So you're you're. Wow. You've already established everything before you even get into the main dialogue with the other characters. And that's important for the idea of setting context in instruction. I mean, you yeah. have a lot of, you think, oh, yeah, I, I also hate waking up. Like Kara said, that's my Monday face. Like, I know that feeling that she's yeah. expressing right there. Well, that has nothing to do with instruction. That's just an entertainment comic. But I just love the story. Um, hang on, well, I think another recommendation here. The lessons are all there. And I, when I'm reading comics, I find myself pretty often thinking, why do I know the thing? Why do I know what I know? So if I go through a page like that and I think like, I, I understand the context, I usually go back and think, what is it that made me know these things? And that's the, you know, kind of the way you read comics of, I'm trying to figure out what the visuals are telling me. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I'm, it's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, and there's um, different instructional comics and educational comics, I think, are two different genres. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't really wrapped my head around it enough to really clearly define it other than what I think about it. You know what I mean? Like an instructional comic, just like instructional design, the, the objective is some kind of performance behavior change, uh, new skill, something like that. Right? It's just some kind of changing behavior as the outcome. Educational comics is just, is more informative. You're learning something new and you have new information and you become mm -hmm. more knowledgeable about a topic or more knowledgeable about some thing. So mm -hmm. the difference between instructional and educational, and, that, and I might be using the wrong terms here. And again, this is just off the cuff trying to define the two. This book is, uh, I mean, I'm big, um, I live in the South, so Delta Blues is my, music genre, um, just because the history down here. And uh, came across this little book called Legends of the Blues. Oh. And it's an educational graphic novel where every page is um, sort of this illustrated version of the artist. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
I don't see that's that's the comic medium doesn't have to be or is not pages with panels. Mm -hmm. Every time we think of the word comic, we think of periodicals on the comic book shelf or a graphic novel or a cartoon in the newspaper. Um, but comic is a medium, just like video is a medium. So if you're, if you're doing something instructional and you say, hey, well, let's do video scenarios, you've chosen video as the output, the medium to tell that story or to do those scenarios. Comic is the same thing. You're just choosing a different type of medium for the output. And then there's a process of putting that medium together, just like there's a process of writing a video script and getting, you know, getting uh, the video shoots and the characters and you know, they have to act and they're actors. The same thing with a comic meeting, you have to hire voice actors, not narrators, actual voice actors, because they act out that character. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a medium. So this is just, it's using the comic medium, but telling it in a different way. I'll have to post a picture of um, my daughter, is two and a half she's obsessed with the muppets obsessed um and she has this encyclopedia of the muppets and it's in a similar oh. style where it's you know the muppet yeah. and then a little speech bubble of something that they say and yeah. little facts and we uh, we read that book constantly <laughs> so well, like um um the abc's um dr dr seuss's abc book mm -hmm. that's comic but it's educational as, as opposed to instruction Right. So there's there's um, technical uh, sequential art. There's um, uh, Will Eisner said it best, and, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, but he says you can you can tell a story where um, there's somebody picking a lock on a safe in a detective story. That's entertainment, but there's a technical aspect to the instruction of how to pick a lock. Mm -hmm. Right? Hmm. So then now you're now you're in the sequential narrative, just like that scene I showed in Paper Girls. That's a sequential narrative. You're telling a story visually without a single speech bubble on that right. one page. But you get it. You're reading the story visually to set the stage. Mm -hmm. And then, so if if you take that from an if you if you apply that approach and that technique to instructional, yeah, it takes longer and there's more level of effort to build one of these for instructional design because you have to put that sequential narrative and that storytelling in there visually mm -hmm. because you have to get those, you have to get your audience to connect to these characters and get them in the story. And once you got their hook, once you, once you got them in there, then you can dump all your instruction on them after that. Right. But you have to spend that time. Respect. That, like, so yeah. Similar to the personification, that's something that a lot of stakeholders, you probably have to have a conversation about, about the value. Um, before we close out, I want to ask what didn't go well, what you're doing differently for phase two of the project. Um, not spending enough time on clothing. Mm. On the stat because we kind of learn at the back end the status, how this how the clothing, like nurse supervisors wear a lab coat over their sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, we to distinguish the different because we had three nurse character we had the superhero villain we had the superhero character the villain character we had a, a mentor a nursing mentor character and then we had three nurses so those are the sort of the total number of active characters mm -hmm. well the, when we when we first did the three nurse characters the way to distinguish them visually between each other we gave them different color saris mm -hmm. and different heights you know and again, Indian culture, predominantly, um, the skin tone is generally the same, and the hair color is generally dark, mm -hmm. dark or black hair. So, how do you distinguish characters? Um, you can do it with facial features, um, you know, size of nose, separation of eyes, how big the mouth is. There's all kinds of anatomy things you can do to, to differentiate different characters. But when you have characters that um, that you're looking over their shoulder or their backwards or their profiles. How do you distinguish them when you don't have a frontal face feature to distinguish them directly? So we just came up with a symbol. We we'll just give them different colors. Mm -hmm. Well, colors indicate um, a patient, and nurses wear all white. So it was like, okay, now we're they wear all white saris and gowns, and um, 
the nurse mentors wear the lab coat. So you can distinguish a, a mentor because of a lab coat. But mm -hmm. the nurses had to be in all white. Well, now how do we distinguish all white clothing between the three characters? So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm, they said, well, they said the SME in India, it's okay to do a color scarf, but their salary has to be white. So we gave them each a different color scarf. Mm -hmm. So that way, that was one big lesson learned. And that was one of the big revisions we just finished. Um, we had to go back and redraw all the nurses. So yeah. we were um, reading Tiki Tiki Tembo last night. And yeah. it, throughout the book, it's the best book. Um, yeah. Tiki Tiki Tembo, and I saw a picture of Eruchi Pippari Pembo is wearing a blue outfit. And on the last page, he's sick and he's in bed and he's wearing a white outfit. And Josie was very concerned. She's like, where's the blue guy? And she couldn't, she was like, that's the old man, that's the mom, where's the blue guy? And she thought, she also thinks it's a story about a kid stealing an old man's ladder. So it's not, she's not quite getting the storytelling aspect. But she's she just, getting a story, that's all man. <laughs> that, that really subtle change completely threw her because she's looking at it mostly visually. She's hearing the narration, but she's mostly looking at the visual cues. Right, right. And, and don't take that for granted because adults do the same thing. I right? watched because Glengarry Glenn Ross last night. I could not distinguish between any of the characters because I don't know the actors very well. And they're all just older white. I watched Glengarry Glenn Ross, which is mostly oh, yeah, yeah. just a bunch of older white men and Al Pacino. I knew Al Pacino's character. I, I could not keep them straight at all. Yeah, so watching, watching, and I, my grandson's three months old, and I'm already buying all kinds of books already. I've got them stacked up, like how, which ones I'm going to read, and, you know, yep. uh, introduce them to them. But the other lesson learned, too, was that a patient, um, they, they're sorry, um, they, even though they're in, like, a, a, a patient gown, like a hospital gown, mm -hmm. they still, you still have to um, lay the sari over them from neck to knees. Yeah. And the sari is indicated of who they are because it has to do with, and again, there's some culture things I'm not really clear on, but like family crests and family colors and mm -hmm. uh, different, like different levels of silk and the mm -hmm. fabric that they use depending on your status and where you come and what your family is. Um, so laying that over is is an indication that your family is with you, protecting you, and so that you, you know, your baby becomes born and more healthy and that sort of thing. So there's there's a symbol, there's symbolism by that too. Mm -hmm. So we had drawn we had drawn the entire episode and come back and say, well, we gotta we gotta put sorries over the patients. And they got okay, help me out here. What does that mean? So we went into this long conversation of what that means. Like, wow, that's fascinating. Fascinating how what that means, but then, oh my gosh, we got to go back and draw all this stuff because <laughs> we did it wrong wow. and we didn't catch that, you know, catch it on, on the front end. But anyway, so that was that was two of the biggest lessons. Um, That's phase two, was, um, and this is funded by the Gates Foundation, and they just approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we just we were just I just found out about a month ago we were awarded uh, the next phase. So, which is really cool because we're going to take episode one for sure and translate it to Hindi mm. to include on screen and spoken characters. But maybe episode two. Uh, two more episodes, three and four in English. And then episode one is also this is the backstory, the, with the two backstory characters, uh, converted to a printed version that can be distributed. Physically to out, you know, to get it out to all these clinics and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take the digital version, and it's an animated motion comic with narration. So there's not a whole lot of speech bubbles. Mm -hmm. But now we have to redesign episode one as a printed version, and put the dialogue in there. So it's a complete redesign. Same story, same characters, yeah. everything. Just got to rebuild it in a portrait layout with panels. You know, like a oh comic. yeah. Um, huh. And then uh, translate to Hindi, and then two more new episodes. So it's a big. Uh, we're going to kick it off later this fall, but it, it'll pretty much take us through mid year, if not farther next year. Well, congratulations! That's really exciting. And there's a trip to India, I think. In yes, I was going to ask. Um, yeah. Okay, 
So we're out of time. We're two minutes over. But oh, before gosh, you sorry. go, no, that's fine. Before you go, if I wanted to take some time in September and learn how to draw instructional comics and do more game related things, where could I go? You could go to Orlando and you could go hang out in a giant game house resort, 14,000 square feet, <clears throat> 15 rooms, every one of them themed after a board game. There's a giant chess board in the middle of the living room, which is cool. Um, you can go play human bowling and you can get stuff inside one of those big plastic balls and be a human bowling ball, um, soccer darts, giant operation hanging on the wall. Um, but anyway, the idea is that that's the venue. And then Dr. Carl Kopp um, and uh, Deborah Thomas with Silly Monkey Games and myself are going to facilitate a four day workshop, if you will, on storytelling, game design. Uh, learning through play, visual design. And then by the end of the week, <clears throat> you're going to learn how to build a game and tell a story. And by the end of the week, you'll build a card game and a four-page comic. And then we're, part of, we're partnered with a couple of vendors who will print and distribute that as a physical product and sent back to you after you get done. So... It's one thing to go to a pre-con workshop for a day or a two-day workshop and learn all this cool stuff. And you're like, oh, I want to go do that when I get back to my work. I'm like, but you never you never build it. You never get to that next step. So we said, well, why don't we teach all that that we typically teach at a pre-con, but then let's build something physically while we're there, while we're playing, while we're playing games, living in a game house. Mm -hmm. And then when you get in, you, you actually made something and you have something to show for it. The hardest, one of the hardest things I experienced making a game is finding enough people to play test that game. So that's another thing that I really like about this idea is you have built in play testers around you. Yeah, we're we're there. The whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I just put the link into the website. So, and awesome. there is a game running right now on Twitter. If you follow the hashtag mm -hmm. step away and play and you started playing. I did. And then I realized that I have a vacation oh, right before right before and after, and I can't physically go this year, and it's painful oh. for me. Well, we're, So I'm we're, waiting for it to fill up so I can get on the waiting list for next year. You can get on the waiting list now. We already got two oh, people okay. because of schedule conflicts that are wanting okay. to come next year. So, yeah, I'll um, have myself. Yeah, so if you want to play, go out and follow that hashtag, and we're at Clue. There's you, The first person to earn 300 points wins a free registration. Which is amazing because – yeah, it sounds. And we didn't do any time for Q and A. We had a couple from Kara, um, but yeah, we went pretty long. It was interesting. I this was one where I was like, Kevin, just tell me about instructional comments. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been. I could. I love talking about this. I love building these things, and more importantly, I love anybody that's interested. I love sharing with folks how to how do you get started in something like this. And let me and just in closing, you do not have to be an artist. This is not about your artistic skill. You can find an artist. I can help you find a hundred comic artists that know all storytelling. That's not that's not it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all the other pieces. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well thank you. And put in um, on Twitter if you think of more comic books people should read because I think that's the best way to learn this kind of thing. Just have like a running uh, list. So that, okay. All right. I, I, you can't see it, but this entire shelf right here is nothing but comics and comic books. And That's what the comics. panorama camera mode's for. <laughs> that one, and then behind me, this bookshelf behind me back here, it's got a mm -hmm. bunch of stuff, and then there's more books over there. Well, I'm excited. Let me schedule a trip to the comic book store after this. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll do that. Is it, who do I hashtag? I'll just, I'll just um, tag you. Just do TLD cast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Happy Monday. Bye-bye.